G'day, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are, whenever you are listening to or indeed watching uh, this podcast because it is on our YouTube channel, Asset Academy TV. And today I'm talking about mortgages um, and I have with me from Trafalgar Square Financial Planning Consultancy, Just Nagra. How are you, Just? Very good, very good. <laughs> very you? good. Sounding very serious. <laughs> this is my after work. <laughs> Voices, but it's it's meant to be be relaxed. There you go. Good. (laughs) Excellent. Well, this is going to be relaxed. Um, Today, uh, we're we're going to talk about mortgages. Um, And we're going to talk about buy-to-let mortgages and HMOs. We're not going to go deep into things like commercial lending and that sort of stuff. That's another podcast. Because what I'm aiming this for... Um, and this is where fifty percent of my listeners suddenly turn off. Is we're aiming this at those of uh, those of the, the investors out there listening who are very much at the beginning of their career. So it it, it might it, it will be very basic, especially if you're a sophisticated investor. So look out for our commercial lending podcast that I'll have coming up in the future. Um, but for now, um, let's talk mortgages. <laughs> Sounds like it could be a whole TV show, couldn't it? Let's talk mortgages. <laughs> <laughs> so first questions are just and this is going to sound really basic but i have been asked this at uh at, at uh, training events that asset academy do what is a mortgage very good one very good yeah. one right <laughs> to simplify it um a mortgage is a loan uh kind of designed to to help you buy a, a house buy a home okay um what it is The borrower um, will put down a certain percentage as a deposit, okay? The remainder is a loan that's provided by a bank or building society, which is called the mortgage. So it's the remainder of the amount that's required to purchase the property. That's in a nutshell. Um, You will then have an agreement with that lender to make monthly payments over a set duration or term, and that could be generally a 25 year mortgage term and you'll maintain maintain the mortgage payments per month that's in a nutshell what a mortgage is it's it's going to be the largest loan you take out in your life yeah and there are a multitude of variations on that aren't there correct (laughs) Correct. Uh, in fact i mean you is that the new york uh, skyline behind you it certainly is, yes. Every one of those properties, no doubt, ha- was was built on a, with a mortgage in place or multiple, even yes. depending on yes. the size of them. Yes. I think the exactly. Empire State. Or, yeah. or had a mortgage eventually, if it was yeah. built with kind of cash or whatever. It okay. Be. Let's not confuse with that. Okay, so <laughs> most people, um, when they get a mortgage, it's to buy their own home, a residential mortgage or a, a home buyer's mortgage. Um Again, briefly, how what what what's sort of the lending criteria on that? So, if if let's say I went to the bank right now and I said, "Hi, I want to buy a house. Um, how much you can can you lend me? What sort of questions do they ask, or do the information okay. do they need?" So, when we are considering our own main residence, okay, so that's to to clarify this. This is where you're saying to the lender, "I want to buy a home where I will the borrower will actually reside in." Okay, that's that's what we've got to class it as. So that's a residential mortgage. Um, so what the lenders have got to base this on effectively is income and affordability. Okay, so they will look at whether you are employed or whether you are self-employed, and they want you to declare your income. So for those who are employed, the lenders will generally require your latest three months pay slips, and can request your latest P sixty or two years of worth of P60s if you have kind of some bonuses, commission, things like that, that you want to kind of incorporate within the affordability. If you're self-employed, lenders will look at your tax calculations. They were known as your SA302s many, many years ago. Still are. Some people like to refer it as SA302s um, or now tax calculations. That verifies your income that you've declared to HMRC. So what the lenders will do, they look at that income and they apply an income multiplier. Generally, it's around four and a half times your income um, is what the lenders will, will base the multiplier on to determine how much you can borrow. 
Now, for some, that could be slightly more. You know, some lenders might say we will multiply it by five times or five and a half times. Um, it can vary. But just generally, whenever I'm speaking to a client at the outset, I would say generally, and I'll try and generalize it, it's four and a half times your income to determine how much you can borrow. And and why do they do that? Isn't it so that, well, it may, it may obvious, I suppose, it's so that you don't overstretch yourself and you don't ruin yourself. Correct. Yeah, that's what Bank it is. Bank is they, protecting they, you and protecting themselves, I guess. Exactly, exactly that. Because yeah. they don't want to kind of lend to you uh, a, a certain amount that you can't then afford to repay. That's the biggest mm. thing. Mm. And I should have said, actually, for for the benefit of, of anyone listening and watching, is that I'm going to be asking basic questions as if I was the borrower. And sometimes, mm-hmm. uh, you know, um, it might appear like I know more than I do. Well, <laughs> uh, I've had a mortgage, you know, I, I, I've got a mortgage. I, I kind of know what's going on. So it's not as if so I'm going to I'm, like I say, I'm going to play play dumb uh, most of the time. All right. So. Um, there's lots of subcategories within residential mortgage. A first-time buyer can have a different mortgage to somebody who's maybe buying their third home, or even you know, their fourth home, or uh, oh, or even their sec- their 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 second principal primary residence, i.e., their holiday home, which is a whole different ball game. Let's not get into that one. Um, Correct. Correct. Yes. So I, I think that's that's you've made that really clear what the lending criteria are on on a residential mortgage. Let's move on to buy-to-let mortgage. What is a buy-to-let mortgage? Can you define that, please? Yeah, so so a buy-to-let is where you're buying a property and the sole intention is that you're not buying this for you to move into. Um, you're buying this with the intention for you to let the property out. So therefore, you're going to have tenants who occupy the property. Mm-hmm. That's what a buy-to-let mortgage will be and that's how it's going to be classed. Um, so the rules here are different. Mm. Um, so in terms of when it's your main residence, it's looking at your income and affordability and they assess it on that using mm. four and a half times as the rental, sorry, as the, uh, the income multiplier. When it's a buy to let, they're looking at a rental calculation that they apply. So there, there is certain criteria on a buy to let, um, that lenders will look at. So some would say, right, you need to be a residential homeowner or, you need to have a certain level of income. For some, generally, it's twenty-five thousand as a as a golden income. There are others that say, right, we don't have a set minimum income requirement. As long as you've got an income, that's what we'll base it on. But they look at what would that rental income, what that property achieve on a rental income on a monthly basis, and that's how they then assess that. So it's based more on the property, the income that the property generates, rather than the in, the individual. Correct. Yeah. I should have said also that we're not going to talk about lending to a limited company because that's a whole other level of, of, of complication or, or um, detail. I really do want to keep it as as yes. as concise as, as so that a, a new investor can really get to grips with this. Okay, so criteria for qualification for the applicant can vary. You said there sometimes some lenders will want you to be employed with a minimum amount. There are some that don't always need you to have an income. Um, yes. But, it, 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 but there is a, a, a level of income on the property that they'll be expecting. Correct. Yeah. So so to break it down, you've got with, with buy to lets. So some of the lenders will say, right, in order to qualify for our buy to lets, you must be a homeowner. So you must own your own home. Mm. So some may say, for example, the mortgage works. If you are looking to buy your first buy to let, they would say you must own your current main residence for at least the six month period against Mm -hmm. your main residence. Now the mortgage works do not have a set minimum income requirement. So they don't have this figure of 25,000 that you need to earn uh, be it employed or self-employed. So they'll say, right, if you have an income, that's fine for us. As long as you're a homeowner, you'll tick the box for us and then you can apply. And then it'll be subject to the credit score with that particular lender. Um, there are other lenders in the market, for example, like Paragon, who would say, right, your income needs to be £25,000 in order to qualify. Okay, and that's what it is. Now, you would also have clients who may be first-time buyers and they may choose 
not to go down the route of buying their own main residence, but they say, right, my first property that I want to buy is going to be a buy-to-let. So there are certain lenders in the market who don't require you to be a homeowner. So if you are a first-time buyer, um, a key lender that I'm going to mention here is NatWest. Um, NatWest will consider a first-time buyer, okay, buying an investment property, a, a buy-to-let as their first property rather than a, a residential property. Uh, and they don't have a set minimum income requirement. They will base it on, for a first-time buyer, they will base it on income and affordability, though, as if it is your main residence. So that's where it gets, that's where it changes if you are a first-time buyer, because they've got to look at it and say, can you afford it as if it was a main residence? But it's still going to be looked at on the rental income as well. So there's, there's quite a number of, of different uh, different criteria dependent on the lender. Right. Correct. And depend on the client as well, yes. Okay. So yeah, lots of hoops to jump through so far. What about minimum lending? Is there a minimum amount? I mean, you know, prices in this country or well, all over the UK vary, you know, wildly. What's the yes. minimum that, uh, generally speaking, that a, a buy-to-let? lender would lend yeah so so if we look at the minimum purchase price um lenders will generally there are lenders in the market would say look the minimum purchase price we will lend on is fifty thousand pounds that's five zero okay fifty thousand pounds is the minimum purchase price so each lender sets their stall out how they need to in terms of criteria so some would say right our minimum purchase price is 50 others would say like Baltimore will say our minimum purchase price is 60. Then you've got others who say our minimum purchase price for our buy-to-lets is £75,000. So each lender will vary. Um, but 50000 is the minimum purchase price that we can arrange a mortgage on. Okay. And and deposits, well, actually, no, maximum lending, I, I guess, then all, the, all some of the criteria you've talked about, what's the maximum? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Again, that's a question that I get asked hmm. a lot in terms of, right, okay, if I, if I qualify for these buy-to-lets, what's my maximum I can go to? And that's that's the difficult one. So let's go back to a scenario where we're saying you're a homeowner, you've got the income of 25000 or even if it's below 25000 it's still going to be assessed on rental income. So the maximum is going to be based on whatever the rental income you can achieve on this particular property. That's how the lender will identify. They'll run a calculation to say, right, that's the maximum borrowing you can achieve. It's not going to be because you earn 25,000. And if we do four and a half times that, that's your cap. It's not based on that. It's based on the actual rental calculation the lender will apply. So, yeah. So it, it, it again, it comes down to, to the income of the property then that uh, yeah so if and is there a minimum amount i mean over the years it's changed they've, they've wanted to when the stress testing wanting to see 120 140 where does it sit currently 100 percent 120 140 it, where it sits at the moment is yeah so so when you're purchasing in your personal name okay um you'll be looking at the, the highest calculation they use is um, 145% rental coverage. So they want the mortgage payment to be covered by the rent um, by 145%. Yeah. Now, what you've got in the market is lenders that will say, right, depending on your tax position, okay, your income tax banding, if you are a lower rate taxpayer or basic rate taxpayer, then the lender will basically say, right, we will apply 125% as a rental coverage rather than 145%. Okay, um, if you're a higher rate taxpayer, it's the 145% rental coverage. So that's where it's currently positioned at the moment in terms of with lenders. So it, it is for some based on your income tax banding. Some would say, right, no, our standard coverage is 145%. That's what we require. Mm. Deposits then, do you, is it, do they, do you generally need a, high, a, a higher deposit? Um, I know with a first time buyer mortgage for residential, well, you can have as little as 5%, can't you? Do, do you need more, more money? Do you have to put more, more yes, skin yeah. in the deal? For buy to let yes. So, so you're right with regards to residential mortgages. Yeah, you can put in 5%. 
um, as, as, a, as a minimum. For mm-hmm. buy-to-lets, it's 25% uh, for many of the lenders, okay. Um, but we are seeing a return with others um, coming in at higher loan to value. So some would still consider now 20% um, as a deposit. And then you've got others that can consider 15% um, deposit. But a general rule, the general rule of thumb is is twenty five percent deposit. Twenty five percent, yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So for a new new investor, that's sort of where they should should be aiming and and doing their calculations. Correct. Okay. So it, with all that in mind, I mean, but we 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 had a conversation. Was it end of September last year? Talking about that, buy to lets were twenty five years old. They celebrated the twenty fifth. Yes. 25 years. Why do you need one? Why can't you just let, you know, get a residential mortgage and then let your house out or your flat out? I mean, you know, people move, they move in with a partner, they've got their flat, they don't want to sell it. Why can't you use, why do you have to have a buy to let mortgage? A buy to let, yeah. Is it just the, the, the law? The thing is, is <laughs> it's, it's going to be the terms and conditions that are set by the lender. So right. if you look at it this way, you are, when you say to a lender you're buying a residential property, you're basically saying to the lender that I'm buying this because I want to move into it. So I'm going to live mm. in this property. Okay. So there, there are going to be certain conditions within that offer that the lender issues to basically say, right, this is for the sole purpose of you living in the property. Now, along the line, okay, uh, let's say, for example, you buy a main residence you live in the property, you might not mm. get on with the neighbours or change the circumstances, change your job, having to relocate. Mm. Um, you can go back to your lender to see whether they can provide you with consent to let. Consent to let is basically where it still remains on a residential mortgage, okay, but you're making the lender aware that I'm no longer going to live in this property because these are my circumstances, there's been a change. So the lender will then say, okay, um, again, depending on your payment profile, if, if you maintain the mortgage payments, um, they would say, right, okay, we'll give you consent to let mm-hmm. the property out and we'll need to understand where you're going to move into. So we've got a, that on, on record um, awesome. and they may give you a consent for a year or two years and then kind of write out to you and say, right, look, your consent's coming up for renewal, what's happening with the property. Mm-hmm. And then they may say, look, you know, depending on how many years you have the consent for, they may say, right, you may be you know, you may want to now look at putting this onto a, a buy-to-let mortgage because you're not considering moving back into it. So it's yeah. that's what you've got to look at. It's the terms and conditions. And, and if you haven't done it that way, you could be in breach of your mortgage conditions if you just thought, right, well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to try and bluff the lender and buy this as a residential property. Um, but in actual fact, what I'm going to do, I'm not going to move into it. I'm going to let it straight out. So you've got to be very, very careful with that. Mm. Um in terms of that, so it's the the terms and conditions set out by the lender, and that that's just made me think of it in reverse. Let's say you got a buy to let mortgage, first tenant okay, they move. Let's say your circumstances changed, you moved in. If you let out a room, would that still be? Would it still qualify as a? Would you still would yes? Would you still be able to have the buy to let mortgage, or would there be breach scenario there, or would you have to change your? So let's say you moved. Right. Would that? Right. So if you moved into your own buy to let property, but then let out one of the bedrooms, and you had a, a lodger or a housemate who was paying you rent, would would that still be in breach, or would you be or would that be a, a okay scenario? If that that would sense. still be a breach. So if you if you mm. bought yeah if you bought a buy to let okay um, the lenders will not consider you they they wouldn't like you to live in the property. Mm. That's the thing. Mm. So I remember somebody asked property. this in 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 the training room, and I think they asked you, and I can't remember, or or if it came up in a buy to let course or something with Chris and Arden, but you, it was uh, yeah. You've got to be very careful with that. So if you bought a property as a buy to let and then you move into it. Um, Again, that could be you know down to down to circumstances. Look, if if that was the situation, let's say for example you were you were having to sell your home and you had this buy to let in the background and and it was the only property you had to kind of move into, then at the outset you could have a discussion with the lender so they're aware. Okay, again, if you move into the buy to let, you're in breach of the conditions on that offer. 
um, because <laughs> we're, it, we're getting it's, into it's like into the nitty gritty of it, very very uh, yes. m- yeah. m- um, minutiae <laughs> of it. So we're getting complicated now. <laughs> well, I wanted to keep this simple. Um, <laughs> with so many variations, what's what's what? You know, I understand is that you often it's it's conversations with the lenders will be able to slightly change the or ha- add some kind of caveat on onto an existing mortgage. Okay, is that is that fair to say? Yes. Yeah. If in doubt, have a, have a conversation if, with your lender. If in doubt, <laughs> it's it's having that frank conversation because the the worst thing you can do is is just go about and go gung ho go into and kind of live in the property and then it, it can cause issues you know if the lender does find out um yeah, it can cause some issues going forward so it's worthwhile speaking to the lender hmm. all right let's talk about hmos and, and compare the two hmo um lending is has different criteria as well doesn't it yes yes, yes. and so an hmo so, just for again for for the benefit of a, of a new investor it's it's a property that has three or more residents forming more than one household. It could be more than uh, and and usually on they 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 have their own room, but they might share amenities. So it could be that they share a bathroom or kitchen or both. Uh, they could have a ensuite rooms, but they share some communal space. They're not living under one roof in self contained units. That's a, a very catch-all, but um, it, it and and it can be larger places, seven, eight, nine, ten, thirty-two. I think at one point when I was a uh, just out of college, I lived in a, a thirty-six bed HMO, and we had about ten bathrooms between us. Uh, kitchen God. unit. It was pretty grim, <laughs> <laughs> but this was ninety-four or five. I think I can't remember. So, and uh, and and again, let's let's keep it to the smaller type of HMO. If we go seven and above, then we're, we're, we're veering into commercial lending, which I'd like to yes. save for another, for another podcast. So what? So HMO lending, how does it differ to buy-to-let lending? Yeah, so how it differs, the, the lenders will assess this rental income on its kind of rumper and rental. That's what you've got. So with a, with a HMO, House of multiple occupation. Um, in fact, you're going to have rent per room. Okay. So the lenders will consider the collective rent. So if you've got five tenants in there paying 500 each, yeah, that's what the lenders will look at collectively and base the rental income on that assessment. That's what it is. So when we go back to the coverage that we were saying, we were saying whether they look at 145% rental coverage or 125% rental coverage, that's where that will come into play. So that's how the, the HMOs will be assessed. Now, with HMO lending, um, there are many lenders that offer HMO uh, mortgages. Some will cap to say, right, we will only consider up to five bedroom HMOs. And others, as you mentioned there, can go beyond that. They can say, right, we'll go up to 10 bedrooms or even more. Okay. Um, You've then got criteria that that some lenders will require you to meet. So if you are looking to purchase a HMO, some lenders like Paragon would say, right, you need to have three years buy to let experience under your belt in order to qualify for HMO lending. Whereas others would say, so a lender like Precise may well say, look, you've got to have 12 months buy to let experience under your belt and you'll qualify for HMO lending with us. So there is that with kind of HMO lending that we've got to look at. There's kind of a certain hoop that we've got to we've got to kind of jump over. Um, however, however, um, a lender like Kemp Reliance can consider you straight in if you are if you're a homeowner right now. They can consider you for HMO lending straight away. So there are other lenders that can consider you without the experience. Um, but yeah, but generally, generally with HMOs, as we said, look. I think we said generally at the same time. Yes, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then we stopped. Go on, you carry on, because I, I was just going to re- sort of um, reiterate something you said there just to confirm. Yeah, yeah. So I was just going to say that, yeah, generally the, the loan to values will sit around about 75%, but yeah, mm-hmm. with HMOs, we can go beyond that. They can go to 80 or 
for some 85%, um, mm-hmm. yeah, which is very good for the market. And so generally then speaking, it, it, again, it's on the income that the property produces um, Correct. and experience in, in some cases as well. So some lenders are reluctant to lend to a first time investor. So you might have to have one or two buy to lets under your belt first for an amount of time I mean, before they'll consider yes. you, which is fair enough, I guess. I mean, you know, you yeah. know, anybody who's investing in property to begin with, it's no matter how sort of gung ho they are, they're still going to be, um, you know, they're still going to need the experience to to get used to running tenancies. And that's something I, I always say to somebody who, who is considering an HMO, I'll ask them, have you had a tenant before? You know, how many tenants yes. have you had? Because if you go from running, well, no tenancies to effectively four or five tenancies under one roof, it's, 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 yes. to me, it's very similar to having five properties. You've got five people to deal with, five different tenants. So that, that's, that's, it. that's and sensible that's, on behalf of exactly HMO lenders. Why, yeah. yeah. And that's exactly why the lenders have, have kind of stipulated that because they want to see that experience. They want to see you've, you know, if you've managed to buy to let at least, You've, you've shown you can manage a tenant, you know, and that's what it is. And then you kind of, when you go to the multiple tenants, yeah, they kind of then have got a bit of experience to, to kind of work on that you've, you've kind of, they'll look at your profile if you've had, you know, you can show uh, rental income you've gained, you've covered any rental voids if you've had any, you know, that's what they want to kind of really look at really. Mm-hmm. So uh, interest rates for buy to let and HMOs, do they, are they, do they vary? Um uh, yes, they can. Do they tend to be um, higher for to, HMO or higher for buy to lets? Well, for HMO lending, yes, they can generally tend to be a bit higher. Um, there is the likes of the Mortgage Works at the moment who got HMO lending at around about two point two nine, okay, um, for HMOs, which is which is not bad at all, okay. Um, comparing that to their standard buy to let, you're looking at rates around about one point nine four. Um, is what you're looking at. So that's to kind of give you a difference there. Um, so not far off, not far okay, off. but yeah, they're slightly yeah. higher. Tend to be a, so it tends to be a bit higher for HMOs than, than buy to lets. Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, what was I going to say next? Are there, do, do all lenders, do all mortgage lenders do HMOs? Uh, are there specialist HMO lenders? Yeah, so not all lenders offer HMOs. Um, so lenders like Godiva Mortgages, who are part of Coventry Building Society, they don't lend on HMOs, uh, or they don't have any specific products for HMOs. Um, now, with regards to others, like I mentioned, the Mortgage Works, Leeds, you know, you kind of mainstream lenders, they will lend on HMOs. And then you've got your specialist lenders. Um, and, and the reason why they're kind of termed as specialists, they will look at your bigger or your larger HMOs, okay? So you're kind of beyond five bedrooms. Um, Your properties that are multi-unit freehold, so that's a property that has been split into three or four flats or more, okay? That's what they will tend to look into. So they're they're known as the specialist type of lenders because that's what they will kind of, you know, they'll focus on in terms of lending. Um, But yeah, you know, in terms of, HMO lending and, and how many lenders there are, there are a vast amount of lenders that we can go to for, for HMOs. Mm. But again, it all comes down to that criteria <laughs> point. Currently, do you know, I mean, I'm going to test you now, do you know how many buy to let products there are currently on the market? <laughs> oh, no, now you're asking. Now you're I don't asking. know, actually. No, I don't know the answer. Gonna, I saw a figure. I saw a, a figure a couple of, I know I should have a couple of months ago, it's something like 3,000 and something. It was the highest since, uh, highest post or highest figure since pre-pandemic. So, uh, um, yes, yeah, yeah there, there's there's a there's a lot. Um, okay, so what um, for somebody who's who's just about on the verge of buying their first property? They've they've got the knowledge, they've done the research, they've got a good idea of what they want. What would yes. you? What advice would you give them when they come to you as an independent broker? What do okay. you want from and this them? This is for. <laughs> Perfect. And this is just to kind of say, this is for both residential and buy to let regardless. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. The, the key thing is, um, and the most important, okay, is initially reaching out. So having contact with the broker, okay. 
and and kind of discussing what you're looking to do. Okay, and that's the that's the main thing. So whether it's going to be a residential property or whether it's going to be a buy to let. So have that discussion initially. Go through your circumstances, whether you're employed, whether you're self-employed, to kind of pinpoint how many lenders are available to you, what lenders you know you could look to apply to. Um, most importantly, is going to be the fact find. So that's the very first step. A fact find is a mortgage questionnaire. Our document is a is a word format which we email through. Um, that will need to be completed to your best ability, so we can then have kind of as much information on the client to then start to research the market and then provide illustrations. That's the very first thing is the fact find. Alongside that is having the documentation ready. Um, so have your, your pay slips uh, available, okay? Um, P60s are now kind of being issued for 2022 handy. So if you get those in your April pay, or you may get them in May, have that to hand as well. Um, bank statements, it's always good to, you know, have your bank statements to hand. It's not a requirement for all lenders to see bank statements, but some may say, right, we want to see your latest bank statement or they can ask for your latest three, okay? Um, so they're the kind of general documents alongside copy of your passport and a recent utility bill. So I always generally tend to ask for the main main ones are couch tax bill or your driver license photo ID cards. They're always ideal documents to use because they're valid for a longer period of time. If you don't have those, it can be a utility bill or a bank statement to verify your address. Okay, so they're the key kind of documents along with your fact find. Um, at the same point, I would say at the early stages to clients, try and register um, for Experian and Equifax. They're the main credit reference agencies. And the reason why I say that is that for many, they've never ever logged on. I still get clients that say that I've I've logged on to Expedia for a report. And I'm like, I'm just baffled because <laughs> Expedia, you'll be booking your flight. Rather than <laughs> I was going to say. So I get that a lot where they kind of go, oh, I've, I've, I've gone to Expedia. It's no, it's Experian. Okay. So yeah. Experian is what you've got to go on to, um, which is which is one of the main credit, credit reps agencies and then Equifax. So you can download your report. Okay, in a PDF file, you can send that across with your fact finding and documentation just so that your broker then has an idea of, of your profile. They can see what's, what's shown, what's your conduct been like, you know, on commitment. So can I elaborate a bit whilst we're on this bit? Can we elaborate a bit more on this, the credit profile? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I think that's important. When you, when you download your Experian or Equifax report, and I know there are others, there are check my file clear score again if you want to access those please do um but the main ones are Experian uh, and Equifax now what that does it provides the the customer a profile okay of of kind of looking at your history of your payment profile that you've had and it will show up things like anything um, like your utilities, your gas, electricity that you paid. It will show up your current accounts, okay, when you've gone into overdrafts. It will kind of have that detail in there. Then it will show any credit cards that you've taken out, car finance, personal loans. So it will show all that um, all that information on the, um, on the reports. Now, what the lenders will be looking for is your conduct. They want to see that you've maintained your payments on all these commitments and, and you haven't you haven't kind of fallen behind. You haven't missed any payments or, or have been late on payments because that can affect credit score. So I get asked this a lot that, right, I've, I've got my report and I'm showing at 999 or 800. What, what should I be sitting at? What's a good score? And it's, it's a difficult one to, to answer because a lender has a credit scoring system. So um, they never divulge that information. So I can't say, right, you should, you need to hit this kind of this number of points to, to qualify. Um, but what they're looking at is that the customer is easily traceable and identifiable that they can see you're on the voters roll, okay, the electoral register at your given addresses. So you've, you've moved about quite a few times that could potentially have an impact if they can't see you at certain addresses. If you've been at your address for a long period of time, let's say it's been over three years, because the report goes back as far as six, but lenders require a three-year address history. That's what they want to see. So they're trying to trace you back for the last three years. 
So as long as you're registered on the voter roll at each of those addresses or just one, whatever it may be, that's going to help. So lenders, if they're using a credit scoring, will provide you or allocate you points for being on the voter roll. Then they'll kind of look at your profile and they'll kind of say, right, we can see credit cards, we can see loans. So we've got a profile now for the customer that they've maintained this commitment. So again, you're given points for that. You're possibly given points for if your credit card is not at its maximum limit. So let's say, for example, you've got a limit of 7,000 on the credit card and you've only utilized an amount of, say, 2,000 as, as an amount on the card. Okay, you may well be at, be allocated points for that because you're not maximizing that card. So for the lender's point of view, if it's a maxed out credit card, it could seem that, right, is this customer relying on the credit card to maintain lifestyle? So it's things like that. Mm -hmm. Many customers tend to forget when I get a fact find, they tend to forget about the car. So, the car. you know, you, you go, yeah, the car finance. So they, you know, you, you buy yourself a lovely, you know, Range Rover, <laughs> things like that. Mm -hmm. and it's got a 600 pound you know, commitment on it, you know, that you're paying on a, on a PCP plan or whatever it mm -hmm. is. And they tend to think, well, look, it's, it's a PC, it's a lease. So I don't really need to disclose it. It will still come up on the credit profile. It's still so a again, huge financial commitment, isn't it? it? Yeah. It's, exactly. Yeah. So the lender's got to look at that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, so with credit scoring with the lender, there are, there's a point system that the lender has, and you've got to achieve a certain level of points in order to qualify. Okay, there are some lenders that do credit search, and that's different. Credit search is very similar to you obtaining your Experian or Equifax report, and they look at your payment profile. And then, yeah, look, if you've had no blips in your credit, okay, then great. The credit search will be from a lender's point of view, okay, the client is squeaky clean, able to lend, you know, and that's that's the difference between the two. There's credit score and then credit search. Now, for those who are watching this, are probably thinking, right, well. I don't fit in that category of being squeaky clean. I've had some blips in the past. Um, lenders will look at this. So there are some lenders in the market, be it for residential and buy-to-lets, who can consider some blips and potentially some historic blips. So ideally, if you haven't had any kind of blips, and by blips, I mean missed payments or late payments, if you haven't had anything in the last 12 months for some lenders, some lenders may take you on. If it's been longer than that, it's been 24 months. If it's been 36 months, great. The longer it's been, the more historic it's been, the better, okay? But it's still showing on your credit profile, okay? Um, so there are lenders that will still consider, but it just depends on, and, and what this does by providing your, your broker with the Experian or Equifax report, okay, or whatever credit report it's gonna be, it helps us identify and say, ah, right, okay, we've got this little blip. So it won't fit this particular lender, but this lender may consider you. And therefore, when we open up talks with the lender, we've got the client's fact finding circumstances along with the credit report to say, right, this is where the blip is. It's all up to date now. Would you consider? So it just helps to speed up the process. That's what it does. So getting as, as all this information together is, is one of the key things that uh, somebody who's coming to you asking asking you to find them a mortgage they've got to have all, all of this information Correct. now if we've yeah. if we've uh, yeah, yes. if we've gone into too much detail and bamboozled how do we how would somebody find you where do we find you joss <laughs> um yeah well look it's um I mean, well we said <laughs> you, it at, at, find at us the top of the Trafalgar Square Financial Planning Consultancy what's your <laughs> website address is it's trafalgar yeah, so uk isn't it that's it yeah so it's www Trafalgar, S for sugar, Q for queen, .co.uk. Um, I don't know whether at the end of this my mobile number comes up um, or my email address. I'll, I'll those, put links in it's... somehow. We'll we'll get we'll get contact details Perfect. put in at the end before oh, yeah. before we so, yeah. uh, whether you're listening or watching. Yeah, we'll we'll make sure that people can get a hold of yeah. you. Um, I think that was a very concise. Um, overview of what buy to let and hmo mortgages look like and how they differ from residential so thank you so much for that um i would love to talk to you again about commercial lending if possible you talked about um very briefly there 
properties where there's more than one flat and different leases and all that sort of stuff. So uh, for the more, you know, more advanced investor, I think there's someone, you know, who's who's thinking of moving into some of these more, you know, um, complex strategies. I think uh, that would be useful as well if, if yes. you if you would if you'd yeah. be happy with that. <laughs> No, totally fine. I was just going to say another thing would be good to cover is bridging finance because oh, it's yes. a, it's an essential tool. Many mm. are put off by it or kind of scared of it because they don't understand it or they hear that, right, it's very costly and there's implications and penalties. But it's for those investors who are new to, you know, you know, new to kind of the, the property market, it's going to be one of those, it, it's finance going to be essential to have uh, an understanding of because you'll come across properties that that will require it um, that you might turn around and say right I can't get a mortgage on this but bridging finance will step in so that would be good to to kind of do that on one of the uh, one yeah of the we should be, we should do that next and and can I just say just I remember when you first explained bridging finance to me it it was so clear and concise you know it was it was brilliant I had no hesitation in using that on on my first property so good <laughs> good good. Right. Well, thank you again. Um, and uh, let's speak again soon. Pleasure. Take care. So you can see there's loads more to learn about property investing. And guess what? These videos, they're all ready for you to learn even more. So click either one of these right now. and You can get some more information on how to grow your portfolio. Click the video. That one. Either one. Go on.